Okay, everyone see the screen? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so there's obviously a huge variety of, of instruments used in the spine. And, um, you know, you get the option of using, um, of using pedicle screws. So I just want to change to um, uh, presenter view. It zooms in the way now. Okay, <clears throat> so you can use the pedicles, you can use different approaches, anterior, posterior, there's interbody devices, interspinous, you know, sublaminar devices, so there's a whole bunch of stuff, and I'm hopefully going to give you an overview of those different things. So pedicle screws, obviously, the vertebral pedicle is the strongest point of attachment to the vertebra, um, does need, mean you have to go from behind, but it's the best fixation, and you can use it uh, in the cervical spine, you can use it um, in the lumbar spine and thoracic spine. In the neck, you basically get the option of, of the axial spine, C0, C2, or the subaxial spine, usually below C7. It is possible to do pedicles in at um, C3, 4, 5, and 6, but they're obviously very small, and, and the, the chance of, of breaching and getting cord injury is very high. So most people would not use um, cervical pedicle screws other than C7, which has got a nice big pedicle, and you can do it um, by actually seeing the pedicle freehand. With the nav navigation, some people would, will put in pedicle screws, pedicle screws at the other levels in the neck from basically C3 to C6, but you know, that's, that's not necessary because you've got the other options as well. <clears throat> okay, so it's a very good way of fixing it. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, the, the pedicle screws you use um, are polyaxial. So the head can swivel on the shaft and allow better alignment <clears throat> to the rod. You get top loading and side loading options. <clears throat> top loading is easier because you can basically drop the rod into the slot. And then once you lock the grub screw on top, it locks the head and makes it very rigid. And this will be a cross link, which fixes both sides. So it prevents these two rotating away from each other. Um, and, and this is in, this, in essence where you, you put the pedicle, so they usually have some angle of convergence. So you um, following the line of the pedicle, you hopefully missing the canal and you, you on the same side bone and obviously above the nerve root as well. <clears throat> um, in the neck, um, I think this is all about the neck. Yeah. So in the, in the cervical spine, you've got uh, options of plates um, or the lumbar spine, you can use plates. Um, you can augment them with posterior screws um, and sometimes you can use them uh, with a structural bone graft. So these are typical plates. <clears throat> They're very common in the neck because the anterior approach to the neck is very easy. And you have polyaxial options and the, 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 you want to make sure they lock in into the plate. Of particular importance in the, in the neck is you don't need screws to back out because if they back out there and erode the esophagus and the usual event is death. So you often have these little locking nuts to prevent the screws backing out. Um, some systems, the screws remain uh, dynamic, some you want them fixed, and there's different options, depends what you want to achieve. <clears throat> a device, an interbody device can be various things. So when you do um, um, a fusion or a discectomy, you, you, you're removing this disc here, and you've got a big space, and you want to fill it to something. And so the space you put in keeps the disc height apart until the bone grows between, that's called a fusion. You can even have a, a device which replaces the disc called a disc replacement, and there's different options. We'll go through these. <clears throat> there's obviously a whole host of them. Every company makes these different cages. You can see there's different shapes, depends on which way you insert it. This is from the front, a direct uh, anterior approach. This would be from a, from a posterior lateral side. This is from the side. And they're made of different materials <clears throat> from peak on the right which as you know is um, called, uh, peak is polyether ethyl ketone. It's a plastic, very similar modulus to bone. Uh, it's radio uh, loosened, so you can see it in x-ray, you can see that the bone graft is going through the hole. Um, and there's, but there's some other options as well. There's titanium, there's, this is roughened, and this is sort of a <clears throat> so-called uh, printed, printed cages, which allow better you know, osseo integration and so on. So it's different um, materials and different ways of making these materials. <clears throat> these are disc replacements, and there are literally thousands of different devices um, available for the neck. Interspinous devices, 
Um, what these do, let me just check where I'm in this talk. Okay. <clears throat> what, what these do is um, the role of interspinous device. The concept is to uh, see as we get older, the, the disc height settles down. So it bulges out in the front and the back. In the back, it bulges there. And as this decreased dis uh, distance decreases, the space between the spinous processes also decreases and your ligament of flavor buckles in. So you have this buckling effect. <clears throat> so an interspinous device is designed to be forced between the spinous processes to jack us up and unbuckle the flavor. So in effect, do what you're doing when you, as you get older, you tend to flex more because you want to unbuckle the flavor out your canal and people line the shopping trolley and so on. And the, the interspinous device is put there to distract the spinous process and pull the flavor out the canal and release spinal stenosis. It's obviously locally carpogenic. Um, and that's maybe one of the downsides. The other downside is they don't really work. Um, the, these are uh, interspinous devices. There's different types of them. This thing's like a U, it's called a, um, actually I've forgotten what it's called now. <clears throat> but it's, it's this, this device which fits in there and jacks it up. This is a, a I think it's called a X-top. You can put it in percutaneous issue on the patient um, as a, a local anesthetic and go home the same day. So it's very popular. Uh, I think this X-top sold for a few billion dollars. The, the, the um, the RP, um, these other devices as well. This is a DM, it's like a, a pillow with a dacron you put between the spinous processes. And the effect is try and lift them up to, to unbuckle the flavor of the canal and to prevent spinal stenosis. <clears throat> they don't work, so we don't do them anymore. Sublaminar devices, you can use wires or hooks. Um, these are sublaminar wires, so in the good old days, they, they weren't very, um, the pedicle screw technology wasn't available. So they put a loop of wire uh, under the under the lamina, like you see here, and that gives you fixation. Obviously, you haven't got good three-dimensional control of the spinal column. It's a hell of a tedious. You're also putting these quite heavy wires under the lamina. You can damage a cord. So they've got some sort of consequence. But it's all they had, and they used to do some pretty amazing constructs with these wires. Um, they're, they're largely outdated now. I've never even, I don't think I've ever seen a wire, I never mind put on in. <clears throat> um, you can also use uh, another sublaminar con construct, so it goes under the lamina, and your spinal cord runs between the back of the body and the lamina. This is a hook which goes under the lamina and it gives you another fixation point in case you haven't got a pedicle screw option. Um, and there's some reasons why we might use them nowadays as well. <clears throat> okay, so why do we instrument? You want to fix a fracture, the same as you do in general trauma. You might want to treat a, a segment which has become very painful. Um, you do a fusion. You might have deformity. You want to correct deformity, so instrumentation helps you fix that. Or you may want to decompress a spine and you need to um, either align the vertebrae to decompress the canal indirectly, or you may want to remove a part of the vertebrae which makes it unstable. Then you use instrumentation to get a fusion. <clears throat> um, Okay, so just get through this. Um, fracture fixation. Um, it's, it's quite complicated. So what options do we have in the neck? So C1, C2, um, we've got options to fix that. Um, let's find some, so don't do it big fracture. There's a typical fracture, it's a type two, a don't do it pig. This is the waist of the pig, and this is the one which is the least likely to heal. Eh? Then there's a watershed area, there's harm motions, it's, it's pretty much like a tibia, there's, there's poor blood supply, and it's redesigned to be an intraticular um, hinge device. So fracture three here is unlikely to heal, there's a high chance of non-union, so these need to be fixed, um, and you can fix them with a screw. You put the patient on the back, um, you want biplanar fluoroscopy, because you want to see in the AP and lateral where you're going, and um, some fractures can't be fixed. So if you've got a reverse oblique fracture, so for instance, this fracture, it's obviously going to displace the pig anteriorly. You can't fix that. You want the fracture line to be um, sort of uh, opposite, uh, aim, plane to the, to the screw. If you had a lot of comminution, you can't fix it either. Or if you can't reduce a pig, remember this screw won't reduce the fracture. You need to reduce the fracture indirectly by manipulating the head. 
then you fix it with a screw. So if you can't reduce it, or if it's comminuted or reversibly, you can't fix the dense fracture with a screw. <clears throat> but anyway, this is a technique, patient line supine, standard approach to the neck, and you can put a retract up there and your, your line of sight is here, um, and you can fix a peg with a screw. It is, um, it is described using two screws to get rotational control, but it's not necessary. Um, we use a single screw and once the fracture's uh, locked in, it doesn't spin. Okay, there's a typical peg screw. Um, <clears throat> the first one I assisted the prof done, he put the screw through the tooth. Um, so it's been quite hard. This patient's got no teeth, it makes it easy. But the patient's got a mouthful of teeth or odd teeth. They're lying right over here and you, you can quite easily mistake the incisor for a peg. And then your post-op x-ray, you find the screw's not where you want it. <clears throat> Other problem is you run a guide wire up here and um, while you're drilling the slot, the guide wire grabs the jaw and before you know it, the guide wire's gone into the back of the head and you quickly try and pull it out and get them to take an x-ray before you see it. Um, so it's quite a fiddly operation. You also breach the C23 disc to get your starting point. Sometimes a screw cuts out here and there's lots of issues. <clears throat> Remember the peg, just, the peg fracture, you also dislocate the C12 joints. And unless you start the patient moving straight away, these joints get stiff. But in practice, we tend to put them in a collar because we're worried about the screw. They end up being stiff anyway. So it's not a great operation. Probably do it in a very young patient, but most people will just fuse it. <clears throat> Okay, so below C3 to C7, um, you have different approaches. Um, anterior approaches are better. Um, so ACDF, if the patient's got a slip disc, you want to move the disc. Oh, so let's go back here. And if you can't leave a space, so you've got to put something in a space. You can use different devices, um, but you want to basically fuse it. Other reasons to fuse is trauma. So yeah, the patient's at a dislocation. You can reduce it with cones calipers, but it's a disco ligamentous injury. It'll never stabilize. Um, so these patients permanent risk for re-dislocation. <clears throat> um, this is not achievable nowadays. So we tend to fix these. Um, your standard fixation for a neck dislocation is a fusion like this. So you can put a nice piece of uh, eyelid crest graft in here. You've got a locking plate and this patient stabilized. The locking plate isn't great for translational forces, but it does lock, lock the facets in place and they help prevent translational forces. And these patients, I think about 95% of the time, they're going to unite without any problem. This is your standard, what you call an ACDF, anterior cervical decompression fusion. Um, and in particular, this plate is used in trauma, it's a lock plate, um, which, um, which holds you stable. Other reasons you want to go from the front, so if you want to um, reconstruct your anterior column, most cord pathologies are from the front, so your disc prolapse is from the front, so you want to address it from the front, and deformity correction as well. Um, I won't go through the name of the approach, that's an ACDF. You can also do multi-level contract, so you can get longer plates to span different levels. Um, this would be a case of patients that are corpectomy, so they've had the virtual body removed or two virtual bodies and there's a strut graph between it. The plate holds it in place and gives you some stability until it unites across that. Um, <clears throat> there's different plates, different companies. You get constrained, semi-constrained, some are mobile. Um, and that, there's one set of plates which um, allows loading. So the idea is to allow um, physiological loading of the of the graph to and the plate just guides it. Um, these aren't very popular. I think they fail and loosen. So I just use a standard lock plate. So there are plate complications. Um, if your if your plate's sitting high, so if you can see, if your plate's not is very prominent, um, this is esophagus here. So if you um, swallow hard food, it'll get stuck against the front of the plate. So you got to make sure the plate is well um, um, sort of lined up against the front of the spine. You don't want to be a plate sticking out there because you've got a big osteophyte. Also, if sometimes you, these patients, if they say a spinal cord injury patient, you've got a large bone nasal gastric tube. It can actually cause pressure and across the esophagus against the corner of the plate. And it usually ends in massive sepsis and death. If you screws back out, they're going to back out to the esophagus. So they all have a sort of locking option. 
Um, so there's obviously some approach related complications, which you need to know about. A recurrent of palsy, um, superior lumbar nerve palsy, um, you have the sympathetic plexus, you've got um, on the left hand side, you've got the thoracic duct and so on. So those are complications you should know about with this anterior approach. Um, okay, interbody fusion cages. Um, these cages are quite handy. Um, so if you do a cervical fusion, you're going to take a, a cervical disc discectomy, you're going to take the whole disc out, now you've got a big slot, and you can stick a fusion cage in there. Um, so this is a typical fusion cage. It fits in the space where the disc used to be. Um, so peak's obviously very nice because it's similar to bone. It's radiolucent. Um, it's, it doesn't absorb and it's, it's very inert. So the pollen bone doesn't grow onto it like it does with titanium and so on. Some of these got spikes. Um, you fill the, fill the cage with your bone graft or sometimes in this case it comes with prepared uh, ceramics. And there's lots of different shapes of these cages. Okay, so some peak cages have got a titanium coating to try and get the bone to grow onto it, um, or porosity to allow bone ingrowth. <clears throat> um, so this is a patient who's had a, a cervical fusion. So you might have had a disc prolapse. So you go from the front, anterior approach, you just take the whole disc out and, and take the disc prolapse off the cord. But now you've got a space, you can fill a space with um, a standalone cage. <clears throat> so if you have a degenerative, degenerative condition, your, your facet joints and your ligaments are all intact. There's no instability. So you don't have to put a plate on. You can simply put a cage and that will be fine. Um, there are some um, <clears throat> problems with the cages. So if it's, it can subside into the bone and you have to get kyphosis and pain, you can get a non-union. And so there are some problems which occur, but you can leave a cage as a standalone or, or you can combine it with a plate to fix it. Okay, so the problem with um, the problem with fusions is that by making this segment stiff, the one above and the one below works harder, and these will have accelerated degeneration. So there's been a lot of research into artificial discs to try and preserve this motion, um, so-called motion preserving devices. And uh, they an effort to prevent adjacent levels. Uh, there is some problems with them. So you get uh, HA, they, they can migrate and fall out and subside with wear particles. Um, they may fracture and so on. <clears throat> okay, so you also have to be very precise. So because you're preserving motion, um, I've got two examples here. He has a, a neck, he's got a disc prolapse at C5-6, and you can treat this by removing your entire disc, and you, there's a patient with a peak cage. These are metal markers in it to see where the cage is sited. And this is a fusion, eh? it's a standalone uh, ACDF with a fusion cage. <clears throat> Similar sort of patient, this one's much younger. You can see that the, the joints are better. The disc prolapse, and this is an ideal location for a disc replacement. And there's an artificial disc. You've got the two end plates, which are with these little um, keels are inserted into the bone and it's got a ball a ball and socket type joint and this preserves motion. <clears throat> but because you are now forcing the facet joints to, to move, your placement's got to be very correct anatomically. So it's got to be spot on in the middle. If it's off the side, it's going to, or if it's too far anterior, too far posterior, you're going to get abnormal loading pattern in the patients with a facetalgia. Um, there's another artificial joint, it's got a peak spacer and it allows motion. I don't, I don't know what this picture is about. <clears throat> okay, posture options in the neck. Um, there's a lot of them. So there's wiring techniques. Um, this is called a galley fusion. You should know what it is because it's, it's just know what it is. So basically it's, it's a stabilization of C1, C2 with sublaminar wires. So you put the wires into the back of the arches C2 and you wrap it around, uh, sorry, beyond the arches C1, you wrap it around C2 and you can put a piece of H-shaped uh, eyelid crest and you wrap it to the wire and that's called a galley fusion, okay? That's just traditional old fusion for a, 
either um, a peg fracture or a transverse ligament rupture when you when you have instability between C1 and C2. So historically, it's called a galley fusion. The bottom of these wiring is sublaminar, so you always worry about the cord. You're sticking things between the cord and the lamina. It doesn't control rotation. That's that well. If your arch is fractured, so if you got a fracture of um, your C1 arch, it's not going to work. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and you're going to mobilize these patients afterwards, and, and there's a chance of pseudothrosis. Also, you've taken a big piece of crest, which is always problematic. So, the options are to stick a screw between C1 C2. It's called a so called transarticular screw. And this is a trajectory. Remember, up here, you've got the virtual artery coming up, leaving C2 through the so called transverse foramen. It exits it there and enters the C1, runs on the back of C1 into the head. <clears throat> so, you've got to thread this sort of screw. Um, missing a cord and missing a virtual artery, and you, you go across the joint. Mm -hmm. So there's a so called transarticular screw. Obviously, for the screw to work, um, you need to have the joint reduced. So you can't do it if a patient's unreduced. Um, you can combine it with posterior wiring. You, so you can do your, your galley fusion with it, which makes it very strong. Um, and that's one technique. It's superior to wiring, um, and you don't need to have a C1 arch. You don't need to have an arch of C1 to do the screw. I used to do quite a few of them back in the day until the new techniques came out. <clears throat> There's a C1 C2 screw uh, going across. Um, I can't see the C1 arch. Um, yeah, anyway, it looks like that. <clears throat> So you can fix C2 directly with a pedicle screw. So C2's got a nice broad pedicle. And what you do in theater is you expose the inside of the lamina here and the pedicle, and you palpate to the Watson chain. So you can see where the border of the pedicle is, and you aim your drill towards that. And you angle in at about 45 degrees. Don't go straight to because you'll go through the visual artery. So these are your landmarks, basically in the middle of the lateral mass of C2. You palpate the medial border of the pedicle. And you can see it and you aim your screw towards it also you can see the pedicle angle and usually up at about um, 20 degrees so that allows you to get a really strong fixation to c2 the c2 pedicle screw remember other pedicles of the sub spine are too small unless you're going for c7 which is big enough so c2 is fine for a pedicle screw and you can use a c1 lateral mass screw so <clears throat> this is a c1 um, there's your starting point for lateral mass, um, and you so you sort of medial to the virtual artery, lateral to the cord, and the trajectory is straight ahead, aiming for the inferior part of the arch of C1, and you can combine that with a C2 pedicle screw. That's what you call a Harms fusion. So Harms fusion is a C1 lateral mass screw combined with a C2 pedicle screw. <clears throat> that's a very very strong construct. So yeah, you've got a, um, a C2 pedicle, C1 lateral mass, and they fuse together. And you can use this. You don't need an arch of C1. You um, you know you can also reduce it with this contract. So you can you can fix C1 then C2 and use a rod and a persuader to pull C1 back. There's different options you can have with it, and it's a very strong contract. <clears throat> Sometimes a C2 pedicle is not available. <clears throat> so for instance. If you uh, on the one side have um, gone too straight to the screw and violated the virtual artery, you don't want to do it the other side because if you both virtual arteries, the patient will be dead. So then you might want to use a sub -laminar, uh, uh, laminar screw. So C2 has got very thick laminar and one's high and one's low, and you can safely run a laminar screw and get a very good fixation to C2. It's a good bailout option if you don't have the option of a um, pedicle screw. <clears throat> Traditionally, occipital wiring, occipital cervical fixation is quite a mission because you had no good fixation options. Um, but modern system, systems allow this. Um, so you can put this sort of um, T-shaped plate in the back of the occiput under the um, less than equal line. If you want to go above that line on top there because over here is your superior sagittal sinus. And it's always embarrassing to stick a screw and all into the sinus. So you go below that line. Um, and you can put three up to 60 millimeter bolts in the back of it. It's extremely strong fixation. 
and this connects to your this connects to your screws. <clears throat> so you can tie this in with your posture rod, and you're getting an occipital cervical fixation. Obviously, depending on your rod length and where you are, you can flex the neck or turn it back. And it's important to make sure the patient's gaze is where you want it to be. <clears throat> so there's a so-called hybrid rod, which um, this allows fixation to occiput and this allows fixation to your patient screws. This will be a typical occipital cervical fusion with these very short, thick bolts in the uh, occiput fixing onto C1 uh, lateral mass screw and C2 pedicle screw. So it's, that's occipital cervical fixation. <clears throat> it's a typical patient and it's very strong fixation. Okay, lateral mass screws. Um, so each cervical virtual has got a so-called facet joint or the lateral mass. And you, if you do want to put a screw in it, you start just um, medial and inferior to the midline of the joint and you're aiming laterally to avoid hitting the visual artery. So you don't want to go straight, you want to go laterally, otherwise you're going to plow in the artery. <clears throat> I've seen it happen, and um, the blood starts shooting out the back of the jaw. You know if it oil in a certain fashion. Obviously, you also want to make your jaw, uh, your screw too long, because the nerve root is coming out here, and you don't want to damage your nerve root. <clears throat> so electromass mass screws are your sort of standard fixation, are anywhere below C2. Um, this is sort of trajectory you want to do. You can do multiple screws and get really strong fixation points. Obviously, um, you can damage a nerve and damage your artery. This is a standard technique. So that's the midline of the facet joint. You've got a, a lateral and a medial border. And you take the middle and um, I'll start one millimeter in and one millimeter down. And you aim for the supralateral border of the that's a joint. <clears throat> okay, and that's it. And you can actually do it without fl fluoroscopy. Um, using polyaxial screws, you connect these to the rod, and you get quite a strong um, fixation point. As a patient who's got um, stenosis, um, cord compression, so <clears throat> there's a cord, there's a spinal cord there, this is all disc material. And you can see that um, that's the sort of positioning in theatre. Use a, a Mayfield clamp, which put pins in the head. It's quite safe. The eyes are free, and you get nice exposure. That's a set. Um, this is under fluoroscopy. You can see the lateral mass screws are placed. Um, that's a picture before you put the rods in. And these are poly uh, axle uh, heads, so you can obviously fit the rod in quite nicely. Locking them down, lock nuts and that's your fixation. Um, <clears throat> so you have taken the laminar off and the spinal cord's exposed. Okay, so choice of anterior posture, a lot depends on surgeon expertise, where your pathology is, um, you know, your, your confidence and so on. Okay, let's not go through these things. It's all around the talk. Um, <clears throat> this is the anterior approach. You go through the patisma, um, use, use your horizontal incision. I like mine sent in the midline. It looks, I think, cosmetically better than this chop on the side. You basically find synoclonomastoids retracted laterally and your aerodigestive tract comes immediately. Um, so your plane you're going is being carotid and your um, neck viscera is a nice plane through here. And um, you can see here the esophagus and trachea has been retracted to one side on the side your carotid you go under your longest collies retractors because running remember running on top here is a sympathetic plexus and it's nice easy approach to the front of the neck post approaches are obviously running in the midline and um, you take just a midline incision you're trying to find your nuchal ligament to try and stay in the ligament otherwise you into the muscle which bleeds a lot um, is now Fermi, and you, then you separate also the section on the lamina to expose the spine. Try and avoid uh, damaging C1 because a lot of muscle attachments onto this. Your, your neck rotation occurs at, uh, at C2, C2, C1, C2, <clears throat> and so on. Okay, down to thoracolumbar. 
um, uh, this is a bit about the transthoracic approach. Um, let me just skip through this and just talk about the instrumentation. Uh, okay, so fixation, uh, you use pedicle screws. <clears throat> Once again, it's the most powerful, um, sorry, most powerful fixation point in the vertebra. You can get strong segmental fixation and control all three planes of, uh, of movement of the segment. This is, this is a fixed head pedicle screw, uh, side loading, um, and this is using uh, thoracic lumbar trauma. Um, these are uh, poly axle screws, so the head can move. This being a fixed head screw, once you tighten it up, it'll, it'll Use you align the screw orthogonal to the rod. The polyaxial screw, you can lock it in any position. You can see the differential pitch of thread. So <clears throat> this finer pitch goes in the pedicle, which is a very hard bony tube, and the coarser thread ends up in the body. <clears throat> this is your typical direction of the pedicle screw. It's angled medially um, at about um, 30 degrees or 20 to 30 degrees, and you want to be Try and get parallel with the end plate. You go to inferior, you can breach in the frame and hurt the nerve. <clears throat> um, in trauma, use, we use pedicle screws. This is a it's called Sean spin system. So you put these long pins in and you can move them around. There is a patient with an unstable burst fracture. Um, you want to try and get the fragment out the canal. So by positioning him, you really restore a lot of the lordosis. Here's the intro picture. This is a ligament gap you're gonna feel when you palpate the back um, to show it's an unstable injury. These are Sean spins and these, these can rotate on these um, clamps. Um, and once you lock that nut, it fixes the rotation. So it's a very robust system. You can see the amount of degrees of motion. So what you end up doing is you put the screws in parallel to the end plates like this, and then once you are in, you then cross these handles across and you cause lordosis, and you, and you just lock the lock nut and it fixes in position. You're also uh, converging, um, which gives a great pull out strength. Here's a patient with a uh, screws in, and when you pull them towards each other, you're causing the screw to diverge in the front, causing lordosis. And you turn this, this handle and it locks the lock nut. So you can see the pins in place and the rods in now. And there's your fixation. Um, I'm now diverging the pins, I'm causing lordosis to pull that fragment out the canal, which is against the cord. <clears throat> then you have big bolt cutters, we can cut these off. And there's your typical fixation. You don't need to. It's so rigid, you don't actually normally need to do an anterior column reconstruction. In lumbar degenerative disease, primarily or mostly you want to do decompression and occasionally combine to the fusion. The solid fusion does have a better clinical outcome because the non union is quite painful. Um, and with instrumentation, your fusion rates are much higher. We fuse for different reasons. So if you have low back pain, um, in certain circumstances, not the average. If you have instability, deformity, or foramal stenosis, those are usually treated with a fusion. So instability in the, in the back, remember instability is, assigned, is, is defined as the ability to maintain anatomical relationships under physiological load. So if I do flex, flex X views, and this um, the thesis moves forward and backwards, um, that would be considered unstable. Um, so that's one indication. If it's unstable, we do a fusion here to treat it. On the MRI, you can see these large facet joint effusions. That's because um, that one, um, this infraarticular um, facet has slipped forward and left a gap and falls the fluid. So you can see this canal should be nice and circular normally. In this case, it's trefoil shaped and very narrow because these facets digging in. This is all flavum, all thickened flavum, which is bunching up here. So this is a case where you want to do fusion. <clears throat> this is a patient with foraminal stenosis. Oops, what's happened there? 
Okay, this is a patient with foraminal stenosis. Um, and um, any way to reduce it or to decompress that nerve is to pull this vertebra back into alignment with instrumentation. So you can see um, this is foraminal stenosis because of the lytical ascesis. Here's an MRI showing the disc which is rolled up into the foramen and causing the nerve to be squashed in there. There's a nerve root in the normal foramen there. This nerve is probably sitting up in the cornea. <clears throat> this old disc is rolled up there. There's a patient with deformity, so it's a degen deformity, there's lateral subluxation, and the only way to fix that is to put in uh, to instruments with pedicle screws. <clears throat> so you can the standard is in fixation is you post your pedicle screws and you can add um, anterior instrumentation as well. T lift or A lift or D lift, and I'll tell you what these are now. <clears throat> so post your fusion, you can do it alone with no anterior fusion. You can see it's quite hard to restore your, your, your height. It's quite hard to restore the diseases and it looks like everything's just hanging on for dear life at the back here. And um, it's, it's not easy on the eye. So, but you can do it in, in the many in previous days, the standard was a posterior fusion and nothing else, but these patients are left with kyphosis. Um, your L4 normally is socially level or, or parallel to the ground. This patient has lost low doses and also their center of, of, of mass has come forward. So then positive sagittal balance. And it's not a good situation. So the default nylas would be to do an interbody cage. You can see how the pedicle screws are supported by the cage in the front. It's, it's biomechanically much sounder. Um, you've also got the option of, instead of just packing bone between the transverse processes here, you have this entire disc surface area to use for bone graft. So you can scratch it out and you can see this bone graft in here. The cage, this particular cage is put in from behind. It's called a, a T-lift. Um, uh, so basically it's a, a transforaminal uh, interbody fusion or, or, and you're basically going through the, you're basically going the axilla of the nerve root um, and you put in the cage, inserting it here from the corner, then you rotate it. So it looks like a banana shape. So they can get it into the small axilla. And you rotate it in the cage once it's in the front here where your hardest bone is. You can do percutaneous fixation as well in the lumbar spine. There's different systems available. This is a, quite an old one, but basically you, you swivel this roll in and it, it interlocks with a with the um, screws, there's new it's different techniques nowadays, but there's a whole industry of what we call MIS surgery, minimal um, uh, minimal access surgery, um, and and to try and minimize the disruption to the muscles. It's supposed to be for shorter patient in inpatient stays and so on. And there's, there's other systems. I don't do it. I do I'm, I do open surgery. Um, you know, it's a there's a lot of reasons to do open versus minimal access surgery. Um, I won't get to it now, but you can do the, almost the same operation. You can put in screws percutaneously. These are cannulated. They may be not as strong, so they can break. And these are the rods you put in. One wow. of the criticisms of these patients who do your minimal access surgery is that you're not able to get a, a big footprint of bone graft in there or cage and you fusion rate it less. It's a big learning curve, but um, it's certainly something, it looks like this is where the orthopedics is going, the so-called um, minimal access surgery. And ALIF is doing an interbody fusion from the front, anterior lumbar interbody fusion. Um, and there's different approaches. We commonly use a retroperitoneal retro approach. Um, you, you get down through muscle layers until you find the retroperitoneum and you just dissect it. You pull everything out of the way, including the ureter. Ureter goes with the peritoneum and you have a nice exposure of the, of the, of the back there. Cages you put from the front are the so-called um, ALIF. And this cage is a P cage. It's got some locking screw options. And this is the one I did on Tuesday night. You stick it into the front and you get quite a big footprint. Um, to, to put this cage in there. So it's sort of like a bailout option. Um, 
Um, I use it as a bailout option if I have a non-union. Some people use the ALIF as a, as a primary operation. You know, there's, there's pros and cons and different uh, reasons for doing things. But just know that the, there is a, a complication. You've got your vascular anatomy here, your aorta and vena cava, sympathetic plexus in, in, in men, you can get retrograde ejaculation. And um, there are some consequences to it, but there's a growing school of um, people who prefer this. You have to get an access surgeon who's a basic vascular surgeon who specializes in giving you safe access to the front of the spine. The actual process itself is easy to put the cage in. You just cut the disc, uh, scratch out the disc um, with scrapers and bang in your cage. And you have a nice um, anterior sort of fusion. You can do it on its own, or you may augment with posture screws like I've done in this case. Okay, so what else? This is, your, this is your approach. This is a transperitoneal approach. So sometimes your retroperitoneum is not available because you've had a previous approach. You can go directly uh, through the abdomen, but obviously it will bowel in the way. And you go straight through. And this is an easy space to get to. Your uh, L5S1 It's right in the middle um, under the bifurcation. You don't, you don't have to mobilize the vessels. And it's, it's quite um, easy to get there. There's other different devices, these screw-in cages and so on, you can get in there. And you can get away with a nice small operation. A lot of complications. The biggest one is your vascular complications. The case is on Tuesday. Um, literally lost 800 moles in, of blood in about 10 minutes. Um, we had a small vein tear, but you know, if you're a vascular surgeon, it makes it much easier. A dealer if there's nothing else you might have heard of. Um, a direct, it's called a direct lateral interbody fusion. So basically you're pulling it from the side, you're avoiding the vessels in the front, you're avoiding the muscles in the back. You're going straight through the sous or in front of the sous. So with a, with a direct trans sous approach, you'll basically put your, you put a guide wire through the sous and you can stimulate it with a electrical current to check that you're not in a nerve root. And if you think you're fine, you, you dilate that tract up until you get a safe tunnel all the way to the disc space. You can then prepare the disc space and then through the same tunnel, put your um, cage right across. It's got a nice big footprint. Um, so you can maybe get better control of a, a soft bone. Um, yeah, so this is what the device looks like. The, the deal if it's a large cage, you can pack it with bone and it's designed to sit right across the visual body. Um, you can do it through MIS as well. So there's a patient lying on the side. You can do a tiny little hole and through your working portal deliver your, your, your cage. Eh? That's a red loosened retractor, which allows you to see, see the inside of the disc space. And there's a cage going across it. You can also do arthroplasty in the lumbar spine. Um, is basically the same approach. You can use a, a retroperitoneal approach or direct transperitoneal approach. Um, disc replacements were um, huge news many years ago. The first disc replacement um, was a metal ball that stuck in someone's back, which obviously fell spectacularly because the ball just collapsed into the bone. Um, there's been a whole bunch of them, different constraints. There's, there's literally thousands of different devices of disc replacements. And lumbar spine doesn't seem to have worked. There's a lot of complications. You need to revise them. And so real, real benefit to revise a patient's previous set of anterior approach. The vessels are stuck down, your vein tears are much easier, and there can be severe complications. Stop working now. Okay, so. Uh, okay, so disc replacements in the lumbar spine are not done anymore. Um, there's very few, there's a, maybe a few guys around the world who do them, but if you go to the Congresses nowadays, there's nothing on disc replacements. Neck, of course, the neck works very well, but lumbar spine, disc replacements definitely out. Um, there are some dynamic systems you can use 
for the um, posterior lumbar spine. So if you want to try and preserve motion. So the problem with, um, <coughs> let me see if I can find the slide again. Problem with, um, oh, my thing just jumped there. Sorry about that. Yeah. So the, the problem with, uh, with fusion, so if I can find a fusion. So the problem with fusion, so this one here. This segment is made stiff now. So mechanically, all the work starts happening in the one above. So you do get an adjacent level um, where you're in 10. Uh, so there's consequence to making your spine stiff. And there have been some efforts to try and maintain movement, but stabilize the spine. So we don't get this adjacent level degeneration as you see as, as what can happen here. Um, so there were some devices designed for it. And one of them was this thing called the Dynasis. We have a, you basically got a, two screws and a flexible uh, rod. And that's supposed to give some stability to the spine, maintain motion, preserve the facet joints. Um, it sort of does, but the, the problem with it is that these screws, because it's not a fusion, the screws come loose. So the dynasis does come out with HA coated screws, um, which is supposed to prevent it. I have found that in patients with, with um, with dynasis, it's still a lot stiffer than the normal spine, <clears throat> and you still get the adjacent segment degeneration. It just takes a little bit longer than a solid rod, but this is hopefully where technology is heading to so-called dynamic systems. And so here's a patient <clears throat> who's got um, two level band discs, um, a disc protrusion there, and they've had a dyna dynamic stabilizing device the dynasis. So you can't see the the flexible rods yet because it's made of, of plastic. <clears throat> and this is an effort to try and preserve these discs without doing a fusion. Okay, so <clears throat> we use instrumentation with infections as well. So if you want to reconstruct and stabilize, there's a patient who's got uh, features of discitis and um, <clears throat> You can go and excise this whole infected column and you've got to go reconstruct it. So yeah, patients have a two-level sort of corpectomy and debridement. There's a strut of, of femur there. <clears throat> and you can put a simple rod screw construct to stabilize it and, and retain the femur in place. Um, there's a thing called a VCR. So sometimes you have... Um, Virtual, this is a virtual column resection. So here's a patient with looks like TB with retropulsion here. You can fix above and below to connect to the rod. But to reconstruct the anterior column or to debride the anterior column, you could use a separate incision. So it'll be a thoracodominal approach, which in combination with the posture approach is quite a big operation. So it is possible to do it all from behind. Um, so in theater, the patient's prone. Is his posterior fixation in? And from posterior, you can go on the side of the body and debride it in between and put in a bit of autograph like this. That's the so called VCR, vegetable column resection. <clears throat> With tumors, you also re want to reconstruct. So, as a patient who's got a sclerotic mass in his vertebra, on the MRI, it turns out to be a, an osteosarcoma, some cord involvement. And, uh, is that resection of the body, uh, corpectomy. That's an expandable cage. You can jack it up and fill the space and then just some fixation of the screw to give you some uh, rigidity there. Okay, so in summary, so to fix fractures, we fix the same principles as general trauma, mobilize the patient, prevent deformity, uh, protect your neurological elements. With degeneration or infections or tumors, um, we fuse when you have instability or we're going to get instability caused by surgery or the disease. When you have foramenal decompression, you need instrumentation to try and treat that. When you have deformity, you have instrumentation to try and create deformity. 
And sometimes you want to correct uh, uh, or reconstruct your entry column um, because of the missing bone, and that's when you use instrumentation. <laughs>